Hello everyone and welcome back to Starship Traveler. When we last left off, we just lost Pete who fell into a volcano on an inhospitable planet and uh, we managed to patch up the Silvana to uh, its maximum attribute levels for free at no cost whatsoever and we managed to avoid infection by a deadly microorganism uh, uh, virus disease thanks to our lovely medical officer Diane and we have just been celebrating with the crew uh, this success and, uh, and also we are probably drinking for, uh, to the memory of our poor guard and comrade Pete. Now we take up orbit position around the large grey planet we were originally heading towards and scan the surface. There are possible radio signs of intelligent life and we try an all frequency radio message. Sometime later a message comes through and we transfer it to the screen. A grey-coloured alien with a tiny round mouth and flattened nose appears and introduces himself as Katite of the Malini mining outpost. We introduce ourselves and tell him of our mission. We learn that Malini is a mining planet, mining melanite, a valuable mineral ore. He invites us down to the planet and suggests our, our crew may well be interested in a visit as the contests sporting events arranged for the entertainment of the miners are in full swing. He gives us coordinates for beaming down but interference distorts the message and we cannot be certain whether he gave us 223.473.85 or 223.473.83. Alright, this is great, we have been told by I Abel to visit Ma uh, uh, Malini and uh, we're here so this is obviously a, um, a civilized and um, well outpost it's not really a planet with indigenous um, intelligent life but we have a lot of aliens or at least some aliens right down here who are civil who are friendly or welcoming us and uh, we have been recommended this planet even though Aya Bale has been a bit weird and you know tricked us into that whole portal shenanigans but uh, they are not evil and uh, I don't foresee any issues here so let's beam down and talk to them see what we can find what are our orders well um, we're definitely going to beam down so we just need to find out which are the right coordinates and there is no indication to tell us which one it is so we're going to beam down to the w one in the middle it's a 50 50 chance so we're going to try to try the one that ends in 83 after all uh, all of the other uh, sections end in three so maybe it's a pattern let's see if that works out oh yeah and who do we take with us right um, everybody is back up at maximum um, stat levels except for poor Pete who died and that includes our beautiful uh, ship as well so let's take the A team that of course means Sultan who is the best uh, of the technical team apart from Diane but we are not taking Diane Diane is 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 to remain safe and sound on the ship and we're also taking Andy Andy and Steve are both excellent fighters uh, guardsmen Andy is a bit sturdier but a tiny bit less skilled but th practically they're interchangeables uh, in the sense that they are uh, excellent at their job so it doesn't really matter I think this is our perfect selection let's beam down as we materialize on its surface, we are greeted by Katite. He invites us into his office and tells us more about the planet. We explain we feel that the only way back to our own universe is to travel back through a back black hole and ask whether anyone on the planet is likely to be able to help. He thinks this likely. A bleeper on his desk summons him to the arena. He makes his apologies and leaves. It's kind of funny we say we feel that uh, this is the way to go because we have been told repeatedly that this is the, the solution even by I Abel and that guy was clearly uh, aware of what's going on anyway our host just left leaving us in his office we, we could theoretically rummage around and <laughs> you know try to gather information uh, this way but no we're gonna be civil we have we, we are guests here and our hosts are cordial let's not uh, do anything that is silly let's await his return let's not do anything risky either we wait for perhaps an hour but Katite does not return the door opens 
and the hover robot enters the room. It stops abruptly as it senses us and various whirrings indicate that it is contacting its central processor. It speaks to us, telling us to follow it. Okay, I don't know if it was sent by Ktite or not, but whatever. The, there is no reason for us to like, resist. The, we are not being forced, we are not being threatened. We're just, you know, led around. And besides, we should check out this place anyway. Let's follow it. I don't think it, this robot is going to lead us into danger. We follow the hover robot along a passageway of corridors. Eventually, it indicates a room that we should enter. We go into the room and wait, but nothing seems to be happening and no one investigates us. Okay, let's get out of here. Let's try to find Katite or at least somebody we could talk to. Somebody who is not a dumb robot. The walls of the room we are in are bare and there appears to be no door in the doorway. But the boot, which we toss at the doorway, bounces back, confirming our suspicion that we are imprisoned within the room by an invisible energy sheet. Oops, why? Sometime later, guards return with the supervisor, who asks whether we are going in for the contests. Um, no, we were invited to watch the contests, not to participate in them. And uh, besides, uh, we don't like to be forced into... Uh, into events that that we we don't volunteer for like Aya Bear has done this already um, but I, you know what I don't think this th th that these aliens plan to do this because um, it might have been just a mistake by robots it might have run some automated routine let's try to explain what has happened we decide that honesty is the best approach here and incidentally honesty is usually the best approach in life as well we attempt to explain to the guards that we have been mistakenly imprisoned and we are here to seek tight. Now we get to roll two dice and this is skill check, skill attribute test and we have a skill level of 12 so we are guaranteed to succeed no matter what we roll. The supervisor listens to our story and tries to contact Ktite to confirm it. Eventually he makes contact. Katite confirms our story and the supervisor, apologizing, takes us to him. Okay, let's follow the supervisor. Katite apologizes profusely for the confusion. He offers to provide the finest view in the house if we wish to con watch the contests. Okay, um, so, so far we haven't been harmed or have hurt or, or coerced, uh, really. Um, we've been locked up by a robot and then we were released without any incidents. So. We could refuse and beam up to the ship, but we haven't really learned anything ye as yet uh, either. So let's accept his offer. Let's watch the contests and see that see if we can we can get some answers out of him afterwards. Um, after all, I don't think we're in any danger, so let's proceed. Two guards appear to escort us to our seat. We are a little suspicious as a sly smile spreads across Katite's face as we leave. Uh oh. We try to talk to the guards, but they are silent, and we walk through a network of corridors. Let's... We have no other choice but to let ourselves be uh, escorted by the guards. The guards escort us to another room, where we are instructed to change into tight-fitting uniforms. Okay, why? We are given sturdy helmets to wear and a choice of strange weapons. The guards will tell us nothing of our event, but lead us from the room down a tunnel. Our heart sinks as we emerge from the tunnel. We stand in a vast arena and the alien cheers are deafening. In the center of the arena is a large dark manslayer robot heavily armed. The door behind us slams shut and the manslayer advances. Evidently we must defeat this robot before it kills us. Mm, that's not nice, so we were kind of, well we weren't coerced per se, we could have been back up the ship, but we were tricked into uh, becoming spectacle for these miners. Um, I don't like this situation, but you know what? We can take our frustration out on this robot at, le robot at least. I'm not afraid of it. Besides, although we don't have science officer Tommy B with us, we do have our engineering officer Sultan with us, and we can ask him to analyze the robot for weaknesses. We turn to engineering officer Sultan for advice. Hopefully he's quick enough to think on his feet. Now it's a skill check again, but this time against Sultan's 10, so we might fail this. We don't, fortunately. 
So let's see what he found out. Captain, cries Sultan, this is a Mark III manslayer. They were recalled due to a manufacturing flaw with the plasti metal armor. Whenever it twists, it exposes the circuitry. Armed with this valuable knowledge, we and the crew rushed towards the manslayer robot with our weapons at the ready. The robot whirs to life and the blades on its arms whine menacingly as they slice through the air. Its toughened plasti metal armor glints in the light as it bears down upon us with one sole purpose, to destroy us all. Luckily, the weapons and armor supplied to us and our crew have an added benefit. Crew members unskilled in combat, so Sultan, will not receive a three, points, uh, three skill points penalty during this battle. In addition to this, if our crew manages to destroy the Manslayer robot first, any arms will cease to function and the battle will be won. Okay, let's see. Well, we've been told that this robot is heavily armed and it's true, it has three arms. It has a slicing arm, a dicing arm and a crushing arm. Now, um, it's, it's, a, it's a really weird battle because in effect, we only need to defeat the top uh, enemy, which is pretty strong. It has a skill level of 10 um, and a stamina of 12, which is relatively uh, high. So we could go for two strategies here. We could either put ourselves on the top row and try to defeat the robot directly, or we could leave Andy there, who is the least important member of our crew. We can always uh, take Steve on with us in any fu future adventures um, if he's heavily wounded. And try to destroy the arms first, which are far weaker. Um, and then we could all attack the Manslayer robot um, at the same time, hopefully crushing it. And we're gonna do this second approach. Um, just to clarify, we are going to keep everyone alive, if we can, but uh, our focus is on the arms now, and Andy, if Andy takes down the robot, that's fine. If not, then you know we will come to his aid once the arms are down. And we have exchanged places with Sultan because Sultan has a lower skill level and so he should go up against the less skilled uh, Dicing Arm. And let's begin. We outperform the robot in every row, so this should be a relatively easy fight. And as I say, this Andy misses, which is not very surprising. He's only one skill point above the Manslayer robot, so this is only to be expected. But the second round is a perfect one. We hit the robot, the slicing arm and the dicing arm, and the crushing arm missed, so, so far so good. Okay, poor Sultan got hit by the dicing arm, but that's some damage we can take. And with the next hit, the slicing arm should go down, and so the crushing arm would no longer have a free hit on us, and that's exactly what happened. Andy got hurt, but Andy still has a bunch of hit points left. And now that the dicing arm is out of commission, we should exchange places with Sultan, so he keeps uh, hitting the dicing arm, which is the stronger one. Let's go. Okay, if everything goes on like this, then we're gonna destroy this robot in no time. All our hits landed. Once again. Ow, okay, we got hurt. So far, each and every member of our little team has suffered two points of stamina damage, which is perfect. If we get back to the ship alive, then we heal that back up immediately. So this is so far so good. Now we have a choice to make. We could uh, exchange ourselves with Sultan and keep on trying the crushing arm. But I say that if Andy and ourselves both land a hit on the robot, then this fight is over, even with the crushing arm up as we know, so let's go for this, hopefully it works out, and it does. The crushing arm still survived, barely by the way, one hit away from uh, being destroyed, but this threat is eliminated and we have slain the Manslayer robot. We are Manslayer Slayers, try to say that three times again uh, after each other real quick. The crowd roars as the robot topples and crashes to the ground. We are led away to meet the senior executive of the mining organization 
who presents us with the customary prize, freedom and a handsome quantity of melanite. How nice, he'll say they let set us free. Well, I don't think they're going to um, pose any more threat to us or throw us into any more uh, traps or, or combat arenas, so we can be civil now and try to g get as much information out of them as possible. After all, that's our mission here. We mention our mission and our desire to find a way back to our own universe. He nods and asks us to follow him. Let's head to the astronautical headquarters. He takes us to his astronautical headquarters and has words with the director of operations, who disappears into another room and returns with a printout. So far as his department can ascertain, the black hole we require is in sector 083, but he cannot be sure of the correct timing. We thank him for the information and return to the ship to continue our journey. Alright, so we got some melanite, uh, we got a cool little battle, and we're alive. Let's beam back up. Now medical, our lovely medical officer Diane has tended to our wounds, and I think everybody is back up to maximum stamina. That's right, so uh, we didn't sustain any significant damage. That's excellent. We have received some melanite as well as some uh, uh, quite a lot of information. So I'd call this a success, even though we were tricked into battling a deadly robot. Whatever, this is the life of a uh, starship traveler, I guess. Our navigation officer informs us that there are two locations being picked, on the picked up on the Sylvanas scanners, a large wheel-shaped structure and a hyperspace jump away, a small black planet. All right, we are not going to the wheel-shaped structure, which is another spaceport. We n have no reason to do so. The Sylvana is at maximum uh, capacity, maximum stats and uh, we are here to map out planets and not space uh, ports, space stations, uh, so we are going to avoid it. Incidentally, uh, I don't think that, that they can tell us anything, so let us instead jump to the small black planet and see if w what it has to offer to us. We drop out of hyperspace near a small black planet. Scanners cannot locate life on its surface. Would you like to beam down anyway to investigate? We sure would. Um, no life does not necessarily mean no adventure, right? Uh, last time we went there, we got the whole ship poisoned, and I'm not saying this was a good adventure. I'm just saying it was, it was one of them, and hopefully this time we'll get something out of it. Now we must assemble our crew for the high-density planet with a metallic crust, and this is important information that we were not told before. Um, with no life signs down there, I'm not going to take either of our security personnel with us because I don't think we'll be in any, any danger of being shot at or mauled at or, you know, attacked or hunted. But with such a weird planet, we're definitely taking science officer Tommy B. And um, we have to take another person down or we can take another person down with us. So we are going to take someone else. We're leaving medical officer Diane. I don't think she can help us in this situation, and she's. We want to keep her safe on on board the ship. So the only person left is engineering officer Sultan. For lack of a better choice, let's take him down with us. After all, with a metallic crest, he might know something. He might see something. Question mark. Let's beam down. We may benefit from some additional advice from our crew. We can always benefit from some additional advice from anyone. Perhaps we could speak with our science officer or our engineering officer, or we could explore the planet right away. Okay, let's start with Sultan. I don't think he has much uh, to say in any meaningful way, but let's see what he, what, what he says. Sultan, what's your opinion on this metallic planet? We materialize on the planet's surface. Engineering officer Sultan checks his portable scanner and is extremely interested in a large rock behind us. He has found an energy source of some kind within the rock and chips away some of the black surface. Beneath the surface covering is a fluorescent green metal and he cuts out a large chunk to take back to the ship with him. 
okay sultan you are you creep me out a bit fellow um maybe sultan has has a fondness for uh, fluorescent green metal maybe he has a secret collection in in vials or in in small bottles and that's what uh, his main hobby is i didn't know this or maybe this is some useful stuff whatever um let's see if tommy b is more sensible the planet is black and barren with a rough rocky surface we explore for half an hour and then decide to beam back to the ship as our air will shortly run out. Trying our communicator, we are horrified to find that we cannot reach the ship. Alright, this is really great. This is a planet with fluorescent green metal and a, a magnetic surface that jams our signal. Uh, we are really unlucky with these uh, planets without any life forms. They, they seem to be horrible. One consumed peat one poisoned the ship and this one just seems to be trapping us however science officer tommy b suggests that this may be because of the magnetic rocks on the planet jamming our signal he considers the problem for some time and comes up with an idea now we must do another skill attribute test and unfortunately tommy b is, is not the best scientist of the universe so we need a roll of nine or below to succeed and wow we are really lucky we rolled a nine let's see what tommy b has found out he suggests that we concentrate our phasers on a nearby rock soon the rock is white hot and he hopes that this light and heat will be picked up by the ship our oxygen is getting dangerously low but all we can do is wait a few moments later, science officer Tommy B dematerializes and we breathe a sigh of relief as we also disappear. Our party reappears in the transmitter unit. We climb out of our graph suit minutes before the last of our oxygen depletes. Okay, let's return to the bridge. This was not a, a happy adventure, uh, but at least we picked up some fluorescent green metal. I don't know if it will ever come in handy, but I'll, I'll tell you one thing, if we ever can use it for anything then Sultan is not allowed to keep it we will take it from him by force if we have to <sighs> all right we're safe everybody has oxygen backups so uh, we didn't get at least wounded uh, apart from some exhaustion everything seems to be fine so let us continue we scan space around us ahead is a greeny gray planet which we will reach within a few hours there is also what seems to be a space station in a short distance away. A short distance away. Well, you know our choice. Say no to space stations. Say yes to greeny gray planets. Let's see if this one is more uh, hospitable and, and can provide us with a happier adventure. We reduce speed some distance from the planet and take up an orbit position. Scanners indicate the greeny gray planet supports life and there are positive indications of intelligent beings. What are our orders? Well, of course, we beam down. We didn't come here to just continue onwards. Assemble our crew. We should assemble our crew for the greeny gray planet. Okay. Now, um, intelligent life means um, we can take the best, uh, our A team, that is once again Sultan, the, the uh, gray fluorescent green metal enthusiast and Andy the manslayer robot slayer uh, let's go nothing can stop us now before beaming down we try to establish radio contact with the planet to see whether we are welcome after some moments we receive a message and switch it to the screen a face appears and asks us to identify ourselves the alien is thin and white-skinned with a long bone-shaped face. We explain who we are and ask whether we may beam down to meet him. He introduces himself as Lof of the planet Terial 6 and gives us permission to beam down. We go to the transmitter unit and beam down to coordinates, coordinates in the vicinity of the radio transmission. Moments later we appear on the planet. Looking around us we find that we are not actually on the planet, we are near the edge of a vast floating plane hovering in the air above the land. The plane is supporting a number of tall buildings. 
Some distance below, on the ground, we can see groups of what must be factories of some kind, surrounded by agricultural farmland. We are on an island, floating high in the sky. In front of us is a group of three of the lean terriel, with a couple of their children. One of the children runs over to us, grabbing our head and pulling us off in another direction. All right. These creatures, well, at least the children look cute, and they are definitely a very, very advanced civilization. Um, yeah, so they have a city below. I don't think these are all factories, but um, at least some must be living quarters as well. And I guess this is like the elite up here in the air. Um, the adults look formidable, but I don't think they are they're dangerous or hostile. Interestingly enough, a child is grabbing us, uh, is dragging us along. Um, we could make our way over to the adults, and uh, that might be a, a good idea. But hmm, we could follow the child. I'm thinking, I don't think we want to be rude, right? Um, if the child is, is grabbing our way and pulling us off in another direction, then we should probably follow him. So let's see what happens if we follow the child. Maybe the, the parents will intervene. The child pulls us off into a building where several other children are sitting. They squeal excitedly as we enter. Leaving us to talk with them, our guide runs off into another room and returns with another child who introduces himself as Luff. What? We talked to Luff. Luff was the one answering our radios, radio signal. We explained that we are surprised that a child so young was able to contact our ship and he relates the strange ways of the Terriels. Apparently, the children run the world of Terriel. They are born with abnormal intelligence and abilities and are placed in high positions immediately after birth. As they grow older, they rapidly become senile and incapable of performing their jobs and then they are replaced by youngsters. We explain our plight to Luff, who listens sympathetically. He may be able to help us in our search for a passage to our own universe. He also explains that their medicine is very advanced and that he may be able to restore our crew to full strength, which we don't need because everybody is at full strength. However, he asks that in exchange for help or medical treatment, we will have to take him aboard our ship and give him technical details of our weapon systems and defenses. This is really um, suspicious. So this little, cr I, I believe what he's saying, by the way, about the general setup of the this planet, however strange that may sound, um, clearly evidence points to it that he's telling the truth at least in that regard. However, he want, he's offering a, a lot of uh, very powerful uh, boons in exchange for our weapons and defense cap capabilities. Hmm. Well, so far we are in no danger. I don't think we are in any immediate danger. So what we should do is let's see if Luff's help is any... any uh, is effective in any way, and then we can still think about whether we want to honor his uh, honor our agreement or not. But anyway, let's accept Love's help in search for the passage to our universe. We don't need to heal our uh, crew back up, and we, we don't have any reason to return to our ship right now. So let's see what Love has to say about interdimensional black hole space travel. We follow him through several buildings into an observatory. He has words with another child who is operating a large telescope. The second child then questions us about our arrival. Sitting down at a desk, he talks into a computer terminal and some moments later information is displayed on the screen. Turning to us, he reports that he cannot be sure of the location of the black hole we seek, but he believes that the, our two universes will coincide at star date 21. We thank him for his help and return with love to the meeting room. Okay, so they seem to, to uh, they seem to be fulfilling their end of the bargain. Um, they gave us a star date. Not sure if it's co the correct one, but it's the one they gave us anyway. Let's return to the meeting room. 
Luff now asks us to keep our part of the bargain and transport him and his technical staff to the ship to investigate our weapons and defense system. You know what? I'm going to agree, uh, honor our agreement. Uh, I'm not sure if he helped us, but um, we can overpower children easily if, that, if need be, or run away, hopefully. So very worst case scenario, we're in a bit of a pickle, but we have come out of, emerged from all the pickles so far successfully. So let's honor all our agreements. We're not going to start uh, becoming evil uh, with, you know, breaking promises with children. So let's see what love has to say. Three technical staff appear through one of the doors and we all beam back to the ship. We allow Luff and his staff to access our computer and take them on a tour of our engineering section. After a couple of hours, they have all the information they need. Let's beam back down to the planet and hope we are not uh, atomized. Back aboard the ship, we give instructions to prepare and leave orbit. Okay, so s it seems that, that the little fella uh, f was not hostile or dangerous at all. Maybe they want to use this technology in their wars, whatever. It seems that they don't want to use it against us. So let's return to the bridge and get out of here. We train our scanners on space, searching for our next destination. It appears that there are no life-supporting planets within range. We decide to try a hyperspace jump into another sector of space. Okay? Our crew are becoming anxious about their fate. Will they be spending the rest of their lives searching space for a dimension gate, which may never appear? We are called on to make a statement to reassure them. Have we learned the time and space coordinates of the black hole, which will hopefully take us back to our own universe? And I think we have, but this is a mutiny. I see that the crew is fed up with adventuring. And to be honest, I kind of understand them because, wow, we have a lot of adventuring behind us a lot of information gathered um, you know what the crew might be right it, it's possible that we uh, have gathered enough information to satisfy even the admiral so if we can get back to our own universe we might be in for a promotion I don't know where what kind of promotion a, a space star, uh, starship captain can have but at least a big shiny medal is in order for us if we return safely and yeah and we have just we we have a whole bunch of uh, sector coordinates and star date coordinates as well so i guess we will have to choose from them so we tell the crew that we are complying with their friendly request with their mutiny and we are returning to our own system to our own universe if we can but that is going to be the tale of another video because i'm going to make the cut right here i thank you all for watching and i'll see you all next time the final time bye bye